Hi, and welcome to The Book Beat, where we feature authors talking about their latest books and guest experts in the world of publishing that can help you uh, with your writing, uh, publishing your book, and promoting your book. And we have one of those guests here today that's going to help you with promotion. But more than that, we want you to find a good book this week. This is kind of your homework. This is a show with homework. You find a good book this week. And if you can't find one, really seriously consider writing one yourself. So we have three amazing guests for you today. We have Sandra D. Robinson, and she is an actor and a media coach who works with authors to help them create video content to promote their book. Video is so important these days. And we have Kim Mitchell. She is a TEDx speaker, and she's uh, I'm having her on because she has contributed to an anthology. And I want, I want you to see what that experience is like. And she is an inspirational author. She speaks on stress management and living without limits. And um, she contributed to an anthology called Inspiration to Realization, Volume 2. And then we have Dr. Judy Hollis on. She is a well-known uh, media person. She is an expert expert in weight loss, and her new book is From Bagels to Buddha, How I Found My Soul and Lost My Fat. And she has a lot of impressive credentials. She's been on CNN. She's been on a lot of major media. So looking forward to the show today. So we're going to start out with Sand- Sandra, Sandy or Sandra? You know, I, <laughs> usually people call, just say Sandra D. Sandra it's one D, of the, yeah. I hated it growing up because yeah, I was teased. Because- <laughs> I know. <laughs> it turned out to be one of those things that, you know, as I started speaking more, yeah. it was something that people remembered. So, Well, I had some confusion, too. I thought, is this Sandra D coming on? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to right. look pretty good for that age, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I should yeah. say yes. Did but. you like her as a kid? I didn't even, I, I hate to say this, but I didn't really know who she, she was. was. Um, but, I, of course, I learned as, mm-hmm. I, as I got older. But for me, it was more of the songs from Greece. Oh, yeah. Look at me. I'm Sandra D. Lousy with virginity was the favorite line <laughs> that I usually got. Sung. So you got teased about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you have been on a lot of shows, Two and a Half Men, uh, General Hospital, Criminal Mind, CSI Miami. I mean, yeah. there's really impressive credentials here. Well, I've had 14 years in daytime television. So wow. um, yeah. mostly soaps, Another World, Sunset Beach, mm-hmm. Bold and Beautiful Days of Our Lives. I used to say General Hospital. And then you've moved, you've done network TV, like you kind of, are you still doing soaps or moving out of them? Or? I, uh, we, I'm actually on a show that was nominated, the first new media show that was nominated for an Emmy. So oddly, oh, last wow. year for the Emmys, we, we, I was back on the red carpet with, uh, with a, a new media show. So that's a soap that moved online. And a lot of us, you know, yeah. veteran daytime folks yeah. are working on online shows now. So it's, it's an interesting space. Yeah. Do you think that's going to work out, soaps online? Um, you know what? Uh, there's something called Blip TV, which is kind of like HBO for online. Yeah. And they are, they're taking really kind of high-end content. And, yeah, yeah I think it's going to be around. It's the monetization that's the real challenge for producers in that realm. Yeah. Well, soaps yeah. are always like live TV, you know, innovative. And maybe they'll be kind of the same way online, sort of like, you know. Stepping. A lot of times. Yeah. And the shows are shorter. So yes. if people have shorter attention spans, they can watch it that's a little shorter. That's true, yeah. with the times. So, and because you know how important video is, I know that's what you do. Yes. And so you help authors. So, uh, you know, getting video together for their websites, right, to promote their book. Tell us, like, I've, you know. What, I tell, what exactly I do yeah. is I, I, from my own personal experience, I kind of know just about any level of fear and discomfort that can come from having to step out in front of a, a camera and, and quote, unquote, be yourself. So for you as an actor, is mm-hmm. that hard to do, to be yourself in front it of It was camp? torturous really? for me. Yeah, I don't think it's uncommon. Um, actually, a lot of people, in fact, if you watch the, the Oscars or anything like that, where you have these incredible actors walk out on stage and yeah. they read a teleprompter and they try to read jokes and sometimes they're just really not funny. Do you yeah. ever look at that and go, they seem, what's they, wrong with them? I know, they, they seem like self-conscious yes. and sort of afraid. Yes, sometimes. it's because I think a lot of actors choose that, to do because for myself, I was more comfortable hiding behind someone else. Right. And I could take on the characteristics and, and take on praise and look people in the eye and get angry and be confident and do all those things as long as I just, you know, was someone else. As long as it wasn't you, right? Yes. <laughs> and when I developed a fan following, working on my first show was Another World. I was a teenager when I started that. And 
as I worked further and further into the soaps, I had this following that people would say, well, come and do this PSA, this public service announcement, or um, represent this charity, or even get paid for, to do this infomercial on skincare or whatever it was. And I would jump at the opportunity and wait for the director to tell me who I was. <laughs> and funny. when they said, just be yourself, or I love the good old be conversational, or <laughs> look at the camera like it's your best friend, I never could find any comfort in that. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, best friend uh, suggestions. Best friend, you choose the best friend because they, they laugh at your jokes mm -hmm. even if they're not funny. Yeah, and cameras, cameras when you not talk laughing. to an inanimate object like a camera lens, it's just not going to laugh back. Yeah, it's yeah. not going to give you anything. So, so what um, what do you tell authors about you know uh, being themselves on camera? Mm -hmm. And then I think it's also a lot of authors go like, well, I don't want to be too salesy about my book, right? I mean, there are yeah, there's some there's some guidelines. I work with authors a lot, and uh, a lot of authors actually prefer to not be in the spotlight. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, they want the book to be up front, mm -hmm. but they don't really, they're not really in that comfort but zone. But here's a big shock, especially these days. You've got to go out and promote it, right? I do. Every <laughs> artist, I mean, even fine artists, I work mm -hmm. with them, and I consider, you know, writers artists in a way. So you have to put your face with what you've created because it actually helps us bond with you a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always tell artists, you got to tell the background of your story and show you creating the artwork and it will mm -hmm. it will move. And it's kind of the same thing with, with a book. Mm -hmm. We want to know where did you get inspired? What is your story? Why are you connected to this? And, you know, my comfort level came finally after I, I had to seek help to get to, to learn to be myself. And it took me seven years and 13 different coaches. So really? my goal when I work with people is not to be anywhere near that. Yeah. I've, I've sort of reached all of the points of fear and discomfort. And I know how to recover from all of them. So really wherever anybody is, I can, I can help them get through it a lot faster. It's really just owning who you are and not worrying about being perfect, which I think so that's many of us do. Yeah, that's a big Not point. being self-critical. So a lot of it really is mindset. Mm -hmm. And then really allowing the author, when I work with authors, to just love what their content is in their book and share that passion and share why they wrote the book. Mm -hmm. And when you do those things and you stay away from, you know, you said they don't want to be salesy, you do have to promote, but there's ways that you can represent your book that are not going to be salesy. You never want to mention your book, you know, repeatedly right. in a conversation. That's, that's the no-no with it's the talk a, show, especially. It's a big no-no. Yeah. And yeah. I think I saw uh, Serena Williams do mm -hmm. that and just over and over again, repeat the book, repeat the book, repeat mm -hmm. the book. And I thought, isn't there somebody on her team of all people mm -hmm. that would be pulling her aside going, no. And it's a mixed message because sometimes the publicist says, be sure to mention the title of the book. Yes. But you and I both know that the talk show host we'll does do not want you to do that. Yeah. And it's only when you're invited to do that that you do it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which makes it easier on you mm -hmm. as the as the guest. So take that. You know, mm -hmm. let them talk about it. Of course, if they get anything wrong, then you want to correct them. But for the most part, yeah, let them let them say how wonderful the book is. It, it's easier for mm -hmm. For the interview, for the author to just give us a little piece of them and mm -hmm. share that little bit of vulnerability of why, maybe why they wrote the book. Why they wrote the book. And, yeah. and then, of course, with the self-help um, authors, I mean, the benefits for the readers, right? Is, Absolutely. Is, is that what you would advise them yes. to stress? Yes. It, what's the journey that they're going to go on? Whether it's fiction or it's a self-help type of thing, what's the journey that, that they can look forward to when they open up the book? Mm -hmm. From you That's know, a good way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I've heard actually that um, something some publicists are doing now for fiction authors is let's say you write um, a science fiction novel and you become an expert on robotics or something because you know you got a lot of ro robots and stuff in your you know so sometimes like they'll have a fiction author on as an expert right yes. on is that because they've seen? done so much research right right yes. yeah yes so, that does happen mm -hmm. it does happen and and again you know it's really take the opportunities. You know, take that opportunity because he'll have a chance to talk about his book, and that's just more promotion for the book. That's what you want, mm -hmm. and and have fun. I mean, the bottom line to to looking comfortable and and it's just have fun, yeah. love being there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that that was even part of it. I was taking, like I said, I took all this training, and there's plenty of media trainers out there. Right. I, I label myself that because 
the, I'm sort of between a media trainer and a performance coach. Right, right. But I hate to use the word performance. It's, it's, yeah. I find myself in a very odd situation. Basically, I like to empower people to basically look and feel like a rock star when they have to get in front of a, a camera, whether it's TV or video. Mm -hmm. So that encompasses everything from mindset to learning all that stuff that a media trainer will teach you, which is what to say, how to stand, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how to phrase things how to look either directly into the camera or relate to a host and, and mm -hmm. not lose your power and, and things like that in an interview. I do all of those things. But the un underlying all of that, I start off by talking to my authors and my clients and just finding out what really makes you tick, what makes you light up. Mm -hmm. And if it happens to be something outside of their book because maybe they're nervous working yeah. with me, yeah. then I have them talk about something else, their kids, their sports. Mm -hmm. what, you know, Do they have horses? Do they have dogs? What what really lights them up? Mm -hmm. And then I let them see what they look like when they talk about stuff that they're excited about. Well, I noticed that you... Um, you say that you can teach them to maintain control over any interview. Yes. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and are you doing that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Am I in control? I'm running with you, Jean. I trust you. You're all right. <laughs> but that. definitely there is the ability. And I think a lot of times, for me anyway, before I had any kind of training and I was getting interviewed as an actor, nobody ever sat me down and told me that I had control over anything. So I just I wasted a lot of opportunities by just letting things go as they would and letting strange questions get thrown at me and never really having a goal for that interview for so, myself. So you're saying like in other words like you don't have to be powerless because a lot of times a lot of times the host hasn't done the research has no idea sure. what the book is about. Exactly. Right. And so they toss like these weird questions at you. Yes. And so are you so are you saying it's like they toss you a ball but you can catch it and turn it around yep. and kind of is that We see we see politicians do this all the time. All the time. Okay. Yes. And we, we make fun of them. <laughs> right. But in essence the way to protect yourself is in a a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. you, you, I always suggest for anybody that's going out for interviews, send some suggested questions to the host. It makes it easier. Yeah. I did that with you, in fact. Right. Um, send send some suggestions. Not, but they don't have to ask them all, mm -hmm. uh, but be prepared because if they do ask, you know what those answers mm -hmm. are going to be. And you can kind of stay on point with maybe three to five bullet points that you want to get across. Right, right. That and are really I think the question to should you. be specific because... Um, you know, I get a lot of strange questions with this show. Like, it's something like, tell me why all your friends are raving about your book. You know, I mean, they actually think that you're going to be saying this, yes. you know, or um, things that are really general and obscure, you know, and that's why. And, and do you agree also that um, if they send like a, a one to two paragraph summary of their book, you know, mm -hmm. to the host, that helps, too. I think it's huge. And, yeah. Yes. Not pages, you know, just boil it down. Right. Yes. And, and I think yeah. if there are a few excerpts, mm -hmm. I, I always think it's a good idea to send those. But, yes, yeah, like the real kind of Cliff Notes version of it. Yeah, because most, most uh, talk show hosts don't have time. No. You know. <laughs> it, it, I, I watch like the Today Show. Matt Lauer says, I read this book last night. It's a 400-page uh, yeah, book. Sure I'm like, did. I, what? Yeah. <laughs> like in no. your sleep? Like, how? Yeah, some intern read it and probably, you know, <laughs> stayed gave up him all the night notes. and gave him like a paragraph, you know. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So what um, what is your best tip? Like, let's say someone has never done an interview before. Mm -hmm. They've just written a book. Yeah. This is their first interview. So what is the best it's tip that you would... Time. Yeah, what would you tell them first? First of all, find out who the demographic and the psychographic of the audience is mm -hmm. that you're talking to. And research the it's show. It's huge. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Research the show. Watch the show. Find out really how do they relate? What's the rhythm of the show? Is there humor? Is it really serious? Is it business-minded? Try to fit in. Get mm. it, you know, feel, figure, no, not by changing who you are, but put that part of yourself forward. If it's very business-minded, well, what's the business sense of you going to say? You know, and how can you actually take what is in your book and morph it into something that's going to help? Yeah. I know that you've got someone coming on that talks about, you know, finding your strengths. And if she's talking to uh, to business women, she can really turn that around and say, you know, maybe talk about the stress of, of business mm -hmm. and the stress of owning a business and, mm -hmm. and you know, really gear that specifically towards that audience. That'll help you feel a bit more in control and know that I always look at it like this. In an interview situation, you're, if you, you can't be so nervous if you're thinking about what you're giving. That is very true, isn't it? If that's yeah. your intention to help people, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's um, like the Tony Bennett story I've, I've told a lot on the show where real, real quick, you know, he was singing at the Palladium for the first time. He was really, really nervous. So he peeked through the curtains. And this was before the audience came in. But there was one guy who had come early and he was sitting in this sea of seats. 
And Tony said, when I interviewed him, he said, um, that guy looked like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. And maybe he'd been through a divorce. Maybe, you know, he, his finances were screwed up. But then I thought, my singing, he came to he hear me. And maybe my singing is going to lift his spirits. It's going to make him feel better. Isn't you that know? something? It helps with nervousness. Yeah. It really does. Because you think yeah. your, your thoughts, like your body, can only be in one place at a time. Mm -hmm. So I know for myself, when I was going through the nerves and my knees were knocking and I couldn't keep a thought in my head and I, I was really struggling you know, early on trying to talk to the camera like it was my best friend, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I just kept coming back to, okay, what am I here for? Who am I delivering this message to? Mm -hmm. I always say for, for experts and for authors, in fact, if they know that their book and their topic can change someone's life and they've done it before, mm -hmm. really think about that experience of where you change someone's life with your information. Mm -hmm. Really recreate that in your mind before you go into an interview situation. It'll actually change the chemical makeup of your body, get you excited to talk about what you can do, and it'll reaffirm because you've just revisited that moment. It'll reaffirm mm -hmm. that you can do those things. Mm -hmm. And then you're coming from a really positive point of view, a really positive mind, and just think about giving that to the people that need it. Yeah, that's excellent advice. And you know, one thing that happens with authors is, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, or if people have told you this, but um, you know, you write a book, and you're very uh, involved day by day with writing this book. Yep. And then it's almost like when you finish the book, it's like, how did I do that? Sometimes you get very disconnected yeah. from the book sometimes. Yes. And, and I think from what you were saying earlier, Maybe would this help, like, remember why you wrote the book. Remember the, the passion that drove you to write the book. Sometimes yes. we actually have to reconnect with that because writing the book is, is like a mountain, you know, that you've climbed. And you climb it, then you're over it. You're over it, and somehow you look back, and you don't quite, you feel a little disconnected sometimes. If you've written a book, you, you may recognize this feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying everybody feels like this, but as a writing coach and a media coach as well, I've seen this happen. Yep. So I, get, I think to connect with that original passion, like you were saying earlier, is, yes. is important. It is important. And in fact, Lady Gaga was just interviewed. And again, you know, here's an artist that she writes her songs. Mm -hmm. And she gave an answer that I was really surprised with. It's kind of similar to what you were saying here, that when she's through writing all of the songs and, you know, recording all of these, and then it's time to go sing them and promote and push the CD. And she says it's the worst time. She goes like into a serious, serious depression. Mm, really? Uh, mm. Because of that transition that is sometimes right. really difficult. But for her, and, and what I would suggest is very similar to what you just said, go back and revisit. She said once she gets out there and starts singing the song, she's reliving the moments again. Mm -hmm. Yes, to Billy, but she's aware she has to psych herself up for that. Yeah. Now, in your coaching, just in a couple minutes we have left here, in your coaching... I mean, video is everywhere. So when yes. people coach, do you suggest that they try for, say, short clips like a minute to a minute and a half? Or do you, do you teach them with longer things as, it, as well? They, they come to me for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, for authors, usually, I would say the most common thing that they come to me for is, yes, getting ready for interviews. Okay. But as far as put, using video, it would be a promotional video mm -hmm. to, you know, to entice people to A, buy the book, mm -hmm. or bring them in as a speaker, or bring them uh, into an interview situation, or br actually bring the book in to the stores. Mm -hmm. So to, you know, to, to buy the book. For is this like, like a book a trailer? It, it is like a book trailer. Okay. Yes, exactly. Same and thing? It, it is. Mm -hmm. It is like okay. that. Yes. So what I would suggest is, is even if they're super uncomfortable on camera, still do it. Set it up so it's an interview, so maybe they don't, they're not looking directly into the camera. That's mm -hmm. a big thing for a lot of people. And I had recently, I had a, an author come to me who wrote a Christmas book, and so she's getting ready for this huge promotion, and she just did not want to be on camera. Did mm -hmm. not, did not, did not. <laughs> but we got her through it by having her just talk to me. Wow. I did the interview with her, and then we had her read from her book. And again, it was she's reading from the book, and she's reliving why she wrote it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that helps a lot. It really helps a lot. Mm -hmm. You see, you know, it's like you were saying about an actor wants to hide behind the character. Yes. Sometimes authors want to hide behind, behind the, the book. book, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So again, let's um, let's get your best tips. Like I know you say... How do you quickly reach your audience? Tell me about that. That is really a lot of its messaging. And you you want to, if they count down, or even if you're doing a video and you've got somebody that's counting you down until you get ready for the camera to roll, and they'll say five, four, three, two, and then they'll give you a little signal. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is 
do that quick little exercise to remember why you do what you do and that you're so good at mm -hmm. it. And as they count down to two, be ready to go then. Mm -hmm. but hold your tongue. So mm -hmm. it's like you're jumping to go. So your energy is already there. The thing that you don't want to do is have that moment on camera where the camera starts and you go with that little pause <laughs> huh? and go, <laughs> yeah. hi, <laughs> you, you know, because yeah. it, it just, it, it's relaying what it is is nervousness, but it, it doesn't look like you're sincere. So yeah. it'll, it'll undercut you. And then having that really vulnerable part, that, that phrasing that's going to reach your audience right away, right up front. Mm. You don't want to bury the good stuff in the back. It's like going to a grocery store, and if you walk in and the good fruit's in the back and the mediocre fruit's <laughs> in the front, you're not going to stay too long in the store. Yeah. So you want to have something that's going to be enticing to people, and you want to put that information in that story or yeah. a portion of that story right up front. So don't hold back. Video. Don't know. hold back. Yeah. 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 Very good tip. So how can people get in touch with you? Oh, Charisma on Camera is the name of my company, and the website is charismaoncamera.com. That's C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A, -S -S just like you normally spell it, oncamera.com. And you can reach me there. There's free training on the site. So I'm there to support support you and support authors any way that I can. Oh, great. Thank yeah. you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you for having <laughs> me. It's been fun. Thank you. Yeah, you were great. Um, so are you living a life without limits? Are you? Do you want to do that? Our next guest, Kim Mitchell, says that if we don't set our own limits, guess what? Someone else is going to do it for you. I like that quote. <laughs> and we don't want that to happen. So stay tuned. This is The Book Beat. We'll be talking to Kim Mitchell right after the break. Hi, this is Dr. Levi, your fitness doctor, making a personal house call, inviting you to join me Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific for my all-new show, The Dr. Levi Show. Join us as we discuss fitness, health, and well-being, including emotional and spiritual health. So don't forget to tune in to The Dr. Levi Show every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, exclusively on LATalkLive.com and the Talk Live Broadcast Network. You can also catch us on iTunes, Radio R&B, or watch us on Ustream.tv, or catch us on the Live 365 Network, and now on Radio Flag and Stitcher Radio, reality radio handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is LA Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Hey, everybody, it's your man, Sabir Bay, back on your airwaves, inviting you to join us every Tuesday, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Sabir Bay Show, discussing history, law, and hip-hop. Every Tuesday, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the Sabir Bay Show, exclusively on latalklive.com. You also can catch us on iTunes Radio and R&B, Live 365, Radio Flag, and now Stitcher Radio. Or watch us and listen directly at LATalkLive.com. Reality Radio, handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is LA Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Back to the book beat. Uh, I'm Jean Noel Bassior, and that bumper music, by the way, is composed by my brother Rick Fleischman, who has visual music. Thank you, Rick. I love that bumper music. I saw you enjoying <laughs> I was it. Dancing. He's good, isn't <laughs> He's he? He's really good. Yeah, visual music service, I film like and TV. Yeah. So, um, Kim Mitchell, thank you for being thank here. Thank you for inviting me. You are a TEDx speaker. And that is a big deal. A proud Los Angeles native and a graduate of Stanford University. Wow. Um, and I saw your TEDx talk about how you got into Stanford. Yes. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. And you got a bachelor's degree in English. And 
studied Shakespearean literature abroad at Oxford. I've got a friend doing that now. He's oh, just yes. in love with Oxford. It's a wonderful experience just it's to be overseas, and you really learn what it's what it means to be an American by living somewhere else. Yeah, true. That's how you really get it. Yeah, that's I know. I did that for a couple of years, and I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're an international speaker, educator, but I noticed that um, it seems like you have two areas that you speak on. One is stress management, right? Correct. And the other is kind of living a limitless life. Exactly. Right? And um, th- that is the title of the chapter that you did contribute to that uh, anthology, right? Living a Limitless Life? No, Living a Limitless Life was actually the title of my TEDx talk. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what was the, um, oh, living your soul print. Yes, that was, living yeah. your soul print. Right. I must like that word living. It kind of keeps <laughs> showing up. Yeah. I just noticed that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> so, well, how did you get... How did, how did you get interested in living with no limitations? Why was that something that called you? You know, when I was asked to do the TEDx speech, and I really thought about what I wanted to impart to the youth, because it was for youth at yeah. Santa Monica High School, Yeah, I thought about my own experience growing up and the things that I've been able to accomplish in life. And one of the things that kept coming up for me when I was in school was that even though I was a straight-A student and doing really well in school, people often would have an idea or limitation on Mm -hmm. what was possible for me for Mm -hmm. whatever reason, because I wasn't wealthy or because I was black Mm -hmm. or because I was whatever. They would see that I had a certain limit on what I could do. So they would kind of look at you and right away project a limitation. I I really loved your your quote from the teacher Mm -hmm. who said you're a credit to your race. Yes, I I had a teacher in high school who would tell me when I get an A in English class that I was a credit to my race. (laughs) And he thought he was was complimenting you. He thought it was a compliment. I was (laughs) 17 years old, and he kept saying stuff like that to me, and I was like, I know he means it to be a compliment. Why doesn't it feel good? (laughs) And I didn't really know. I didn't have the consciousness at 17 to really know why that didn't feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you sort of figured that out, right? I did figure it out later. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's funny how sometimes you can have people who challenge you, but also who really help you grow. Yeah, it sounds like he pushed you a little bit to kind he, of... He did push me because I saw that he didn't know that there could be other African-American people out there like me who are very smart and intelligent. Mm-hmm. And I, in a way, felt like I had to really represent that in mm-hmm. some way. And I really was just being myself, you know? I was just showing up as Kim in that situation. Mm-hmm. But he saw it in a completely different light than I saw myself. And so you said, I think, in the TEDx speech, I mean, that in a way sort of you started thinking about what limitations are and how people impose them. Is that kind of what happened? Yes, and what I've learned about limitations is that when you tell someone you have a goal or you want to do something, a lot of times people are so empathetic that they put themselves in your shoes Mm -hmm. and they think about themselves doing it and because it frightens them, they tell you that you can't do it. It's almost like they project it on you. And so I've come to understand that it isn't always out of cruelty that people do that. Sometimes it's just them projecting their fears and they see you living and shining your light when they recognize they're not doing that then they have a tendency to discourage you. Mm -hmm. And so you really just want to recognize that and not take that as personally as we're tempted to and really realize where that comes from. That's a new slant on that. I mean, Mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense. Sure. But, you know, um, I have never thought about it that way Mm -hmm. before, that it really is their fears. Especially, you know, as authors know, when you say, I'm writing a book, Mm -hmm. you know, and then you're going to get all kinds of people's projections back at you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For, For me and for my experience, though, I have to say my friends, have been saying to me, finally, because I just started writing yeah. my, my solo book now. Mm-hmm. You know, Good. the book we're talking yeah. about today, I wrote a few years ago, but I started to write my own book. And uh, my friends are like, finally, we've been waiting. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then what I think may happen mm-hmm. um, is they're going to start saying, well, when's the book coming out? Exactly. Because I work with a lot of people. It's like, you know, they're, they're, it's like, do they want a book or do they want a product? Right. If they want a real book that comes from their heart, sometimes it takes some time because you yes. know how it is. You start to kind of do a little soul searching. What do I really want in this book? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like you're going to churn it out in six weeks. But now your friends are going like, well, you've been writing that book for like a year. When's it coming out? But it's yeah. funny. We're always like that with everything, though. And I think part of it is because we don't stay present. Mm-hmm. And so when someone has a boyfriend, everyone wants to know when you're going to get married. Right, that's when you true. get married, they want to know when you're going to have a child. When you have yeah. one child, when you're going to have another. Yeah. So we're always kind of looking forward to the next thing that's rather true. than being fully present in where we are right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the practices that I engage in is to really try to remember to be present mm-hmm. and fully present in every moment so that I can enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't get past me. 
Well, I have a feeling that that is something that has to do with stress uh, management and mm -hmm. stress relief, right? Yes. Is it being in the moment? That's Part of the stress that I've seen that people get into is from unmet expectations. And so they have an idea that they project on how something should go, and when it doesn't go that way, it upsets them. Mm -hmm. And when you look up the definition of stress in the dictionary, what I tell people is it's a very long, convoluted mm -hmm. definition, mm -hmm. but the key word in it is equilibrium. And that's what causes people stress. They expect things to keep going on in one direction, and when it changes, as, as in equilibrium no longer being <laughs> established, then they have a problem with it. But we, we know that the nature of life has changed, so there's no way you're going to stop that. Mm -hmm. So being present in the moment, accepting what is, is a way to combat stress because a lot of times the stress that we feel is a result of our thinking, our thinking around events. I think it's always the result of our thinking, exactly. isn't it? Exactly, yeah. If we, if we go with the assumption that events are neutral, then yes, mm -hmm. we create our own stress, absolutely. Right. So, you know, it's interesting because you, you, so you've become a stress management expert. Mm -hmm. Do you coach people? Do you counsel people? Sort of? I spend a lot of time speaking to people about stress management. I do workshops and keynote speeches. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, the reason why I started talking about it is because I had a lot of stressful situations come up in life that happened to me, and my mom turned to me one day and said, how are you not upset, and how are you staying sane with all these things happening to you? And I actually had to stop and think about it and figure out how I was doing it, mm -hmm. and that's how I started speaking about it. Wow. So it came from experience. Mm -hmm. Well, give us an example. Like, what was something that, you know how you look back on something, mm -hmm. and I mean, in retrospect, you know, you know you got through it, but what was something really bad that happened where you felt stuck mm -hmm. and how did you cope with it? Well, I, the example that caused me to start speaking on it was being laid off twice in a six month period. Wow. And so it was interesting because in each example, when I went into the director's office to talk to them about whatever we were going to talk about, I did not expect to lose my job. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't my expectation. In one case, I actually thought I was going to get a promotion, which is actually oh, wow. funny. <laughs> that actually <laughs> happened. But oh, what I found long was... Long way around. Kind right. Of <laughs> but what I found was that I had to be grateful. So when my mom asked me that question after those two layoffs, and she said, what are you doing to keep yourself from going crazy... I realized that I had an underlying sense of gratitude because I recognized that I'd gone through things in my life before, but nothing has ever taken me under. And when we remember that and we're grateful for that, it helps to really alleviate that stress. Just to think back and say, you know, I've had other challenges, and you know what? I always get through them. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. There's so many things that you can do. I have what's what I call a God jar. And what I do is things that I'm stressed out about, I put into a jar, and the jar just says that God is in control of this and God mm. is taking care of this. Mm. And when I look at that jar in my closet, it's filled with paper from things that have happened to me years ago. I don't even remember what's in there anymore. Right, right. And that reminds me. To get know, perspective, right? Get, get perspective mm -hmm. and be grateful. So yeah. that's one of the key things that I've found is to be grateful. And that's something I've noticed, too, because when something really bad happens, I, I always know, like, other bad things have happened, but, you know, you're going to be on the other side of it. Absolutely. And if you're, if it were, like, two months from now, looking back, I mean, what is this really going to mean? Right. It seems like it's huge now. But, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's like when we have a problem, my analogy that I use is we're like that horse in Central Park with the blinders on. They put the blinders on the horse so it can only see one thing, and that's how we are. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have a problem, it's just larger than life. And other people can give us advice because it's not them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's us. And so if we can depersonalize the problem, that's one of the ways we can also really release our stress. So how you know? do you depersonalize it? Like I think realizing that life is not against you. I think sometimes when we have problems, we think that life is coming after us. They're out to get us. Yeah. Why mm -hmm. is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. Why? You know, mm -hmm. but we're always meant to grow through experiences and all our experiences make us stronger. So if we look at it that way, that life is for us. And if this experience comes up, there's going to be a, absolutely a positive outcome that's going to come out of it. And we decide what that outcome is going to be then we can live a life that's a lot less stress, mm -hmm. stressful. And I think the important thing is that that has worked for you, mm -hmm. right? Because um, I know there's a lot of people out there or some people, uh, and they've heard a lot of people say, well, you have to think positive mm -hmm. and stuff. But, you know, we hear that. Sure. And so right in the midst of it, sure. it is hard. What it's, do you say to somebody like that? Yeah, what I say is you can't do a spiritual bypass. And by spiritual bypass, mm -hmm. what I mean is, 
go from zero to 60 in your consciousness in terms of happy, sad Mm -hmm. in two seconds. You just, Mm -hmm. you can't do it. So you do have to accept where you are, but you also have to employ that sense of gratitude that I was talking about. And I'll give you an example. I had a job at one point in my life that I really didn't like anymore. I had outgrown it. I didn't want to do it anymore, but I, I wasn't at a point yet where I could quit. And so I started taking pink note paper to work with me. Pink is my favorite color. Mm-hmm. And I would sit there and write down the things that I appreciated about the job. And I would find things from the chocolate chip cookies in the cafeteria are great <laughs> to the fact that there's a tree outside my window. And I would write down these things at work on breaks, constantly writing down things I was grateful for. And, you know, it did shift and change my perspective on that situation by stopping this focus on the negativity and things I didn't like and putting my focus on the things that I could appreciate while I was still there. Mm -hmm. And it made the job more memorable and it gave me a greater appreciation for even having that experience. So at some point you do have to make that shift. You have Mm -hmm. to do a little bit of efforting to try to maybe find one thing positive, right? Just anything. I mean, I tell people if you have to start with, I took a breath, And I didn't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. Start there. Right, right. Because otherwise you spiral downward. Exactly. I mean, we know it does get worse when you, I mean, I think the biggest argument for positive thinking is that it just doesn't feel good to have a lot of negative thinking. Right. You know? And uh, Abraham and a lot of other spiritual teachers talk about how we have control over our thoughts. Yeah. And that we can look for better feeling thoughts. Well, and they I do knew, help. I knew you were into Abraham Hicks. <laughs> I live and breathe it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then we know about the emotional scale. Yes, <laughs> our emotional guidance system, they right. call it. And our right. emotions are our guide, letting us know if we're thinking thoughts that are productive or are not productive. So right. if we don't feel good about something, what we're thinking, that's a good indication we need to think something else. Right. AbrahamHicks.com, folks. <laughs> 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 so um, we just have a couple minutes left, but... Um, I want you to talk about staring down a squirrel. I must know about that. You oh, said, yes. you ask about that talk. What is you, that about? You have to ask about yeah. that. So I developed a talk on stress management, and the title is Staring Down a Squirrel. <laughs> and when people see that title, they go, what is that about? And it is a great analogy that I came up with based on walking in my neighborhood and seeing a woman encounter a squirrel on top of a fence. And it was on top of a fence that was like the entry to her building, and she wanted to put her key in and go through the fence, but the squirrel was on top. (laughs) So what I ask people in my stress management workshop is, tell me all the different things she can do to solve this problem. And they come up with all kinds of wonderful ideas and examples, and then I act out for them what she actually did, and they can't believe it. So do you want to know what she actually did? Absolutely, yeah. She screamed. (laughs) Now, can you imagine me acting this out? So she screamed, move, squirrel, squirrel, move, move. And I'm like (laughs) acting this out for my audience. And they're like, really? (laughs) And I said, now, you want to jump ahead and you want to judge her for that. But think about the times when you have problems and you go into resistance. Because it's when it's you, that's all you can see. And that's all she could see. And I point out to them that it was a beautiful sunny day. There was a park across the street. She had food in her hands. There really wasn't anything wrong. Mm -hmm. in that moment, but she chose to focus on that resistance to that change in her routine. Because we Mm -hmm. have to imagine she goes through that gate all the time Mm -hmm. to get into her apartment. So we talk about that. You know, how are we, what squirrels are we staring down in our lives Mm -hmm. that we go into resistance with? Because we don't want to see that change. And then we develop Mm -hmm. tools from there. (laughs) That's really great. I love that analogy. If she had food in her hand, I I, I think if she had just tossed some food out, maybe that squirrel would have gone for it. And you know that's one of the (laughs) answers that people come up with. And what's fascinating is all the answers that they generate correspond to the three key tools that I teach people to use to manage stress. Mm. And it works every time. I've been speaking on it for years. What are the three keys? I I don't give them the tools. I make (laughs) them generate them. One is creativity, which is what you just spoke to. Mm -hmm. Taking what you have at your disposal, Mm -hmm. throwing that fry hoping the squirrel will go for it so that you can go on about your business. The other one is cooperation, getting other people involved in your problem, overcoming your ego, asking for advice, Mm -hmm. asking people to help you. Mm -hmm. And the last one I've already spoken of, which is gratitude. It's Mm -hmm. a beautiful sunny day. There's a park across the street. Mm -hmm. She could have gone and sat down and eaten her food come back, the squirrel would be gone. Mm -hmm. Or she could have sat there and communed with the squirrel. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many different options that we have other than resistance when we are faced with stressful situations. Yeah, she kind of made the squirrel into an enemy. That was her first first And I always (laughs) joke with people and I say, you know, the squirrel's sitting on a fence eating a nut. You're a squirrel with dinner, 
And you you got a show. <laughs> dinner and a show. The woman screaming her head off. I mean, come on, you got dinner and a show, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna stay there. And that's what the squirrel did. Of well, course. Yeah. You know, that problem is not gonna go anywhere when you resist it. Mm, very, very good advice. Mm -hmm. So and just um I just wanna talk for a minute about um so you 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 didn't have a book yet, but you took this opportunity to get into one of these anthologies. Yes. Um, now, we know that you do have to pay for that. Authors know that, mm -hmm. you know. However, it is a way to actually become published, it right? It is. How did that work out for you? It worked out really well. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes you say yes to things, and then you have to figure out how to make it work after. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where I had the opportunity, and I wanted the opportunity, and then I had to come up with something to write about. Right. So I said yes before I actually had something that I wanted but it's to a, write about. It's a good way to get your feet wet, isn't it? It's an excellent way to get your feet wet. Um, you're doing it in consort with many other people, in my case, with other women who are business owners. Mm -hmm. And so you can benefit from their advice, and you don't feel like you have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. And so it was a nice stepping stone into that next step for me, which probably is going to be self-publishing for my first book. Right, right. And and that probably is a good choice these days. I wouldn't have said that like a couple of years ago, but you um, yeah, I, I think you're on the right track yes. with that. So how can people get in touch with you? People can get in touch with me through my email, which is Mitchell, two L's on my last name, MitchellKMM at gmail.com. And that is the best way to reach me for speaking engagements or anything people have questions about. Well, Kim Mitchell, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much <laughs> for the opportunity. So our next guest has struggled with weight since the age of eight, but she finally got to the root of the problem. She lost 85 pounds, and I think she's lost even more since then, and has kept us kept it off. She'll tell us how she found herself and lost her fat after the break. So stay tuned. This is the book beat here at LA Talk Live, where we're more than just talk. Or watch us on Ustream.tv, Reality Radio, handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is L.A. Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Hi, this is Dr. Lewis Logan, inviting you to join me every Friday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon for Faith on the Front Line. We don't just talk about it. We are about it. That's our motto. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. We highlight the issues and challenges that we face today and how faith communities and leaders make a difference. So don't forget to tune in to Faith on the Front Line exclusively here on L.A. Talk Live. You can also catch us on iTunes Radio and R&B and watch us on Ustream TV. Reality Radio handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is L.A. Talk Live. And we are more than just talk. Hi, this is Don Christie inviting you to join me every Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, for my all new show, The Don Christie Show. Join me as I discuss love, spiritual readings, your purpose, why am I born, what am I here to do. So don't forget to tune in. The Dawn Christie Show at 1 p.m. Pacific, exclusively on LA Talk Live. You can also catch us on iTunes Radio R&B or watch us on Ustream TV, Reality Radio, handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is LA Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Hi, 
Hi, and welcome back to The Book Beat. Um, I'm Jean Noel Bassior, and I'm here with my guest, Dr. Judy Hollis. And she uh, is a licensed family therapist who opened the nation's first eating disorders unit and has authored several books. I'm sure you've heard of one of them, Fat is a Family Affair. This has sold over 500,000 copies. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Is, are you kind of amazed at this? I mean, I'm amazed, and I'm also so grateful that so many people have benefited from what I had to say. I there must have been wrote it to get out of the field. I thought, I'll just put down what we found works in treatment centers, yeah. and it became a national bestseller. I got on so, Oprah, and it slam-dunked me into continuing yeah, this I work. I know. Oprah will sell out like a printing in a day, right? It's yeah. A, yeah. And, but I love your titles, too. See, I think your titles are great. Um, Fat and Furious, yeah, that Hot and Heavy. About Mothers and Daughters. Mm-hmm. Uh, hot and Heavy. Hot and Heavy is about sexuality and eating. Mm-hmm. And from, that sounds interesting, and From Bagels to Buddha. That's It's your right. latest book, right? Uh-huh. You've been featured on CNN, Extra, Inside Edition, Oprah, Sally. I've interviewed Maury and Sally. Yes, <laughs> and, all and most recently, Dr. Oz. And Dr. Oz, that's really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, I, I share, I'm on his Share Care page. So oh, if people good. want to ask me questions, they can either go to my website or Dr. Oz's share care and ask questions. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, you know, where this all started. I mean, you were overweight at the age of eight. Oh, yeah. And you say that you just love to eat, right? Was that? Well, you know, everybody who's overweight will say, oh, I don't have any real problems. I just love to eat. Huh. But I did become a psychologist to figure out why I ate. Hmm. And I knew a lot of things. I was an expert in drug addiction. And I could stand in front of the refrigerator and explain to you why I was eating. Hmm. I understood. While you were eating, right? Exactly. <laughs> I understood my eating, but I needed help from other people, and I needed to surrender to the fact that as smart as I was and as hard as I was trying, the end result was I kept getting heavier and heavier. And if you look at everyone in our country, people don't want to be fat, and they're trying really, really hard. And it continues to get worse and worse. So with, you know, we say one can't, two can. So the first thing for me was, even though I was an expert in addiction, I had to surrender to the fact that this thing had the best of me. And I had to ask other people, other fellow sufferers, Mm -hmm. to help me in how do you get out of this thing? Mm -hmm. Not understanding how I got into it, Mm -hmm. but how do I walk out of it? Is overeating an illness? Well, I was one of the first proponents of that idea that it's a disease, the disease concept, just like in alcoholism, meaning that we suffer, suffer from a physical addiction as well as a psychological obsession. And we have to treat both parts. Now, everything in our culture teaches us to treat the physical, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, you know, and we keep getting fatter. And until we deal with the underlying things that are also helping us keep returning to food as both a nurturer and a punisher. Mm-hmm. And see, that's what's very interesting. And I mm-hmm. dealt with that more in the, hot and, uh, the mm-hmm. Fat and Furious book about mm-hmm. mothers and daughters, that we had our wires crossed between nurturance and punishment. Mm-hmm. And we had to find a way to keep knowing how to get nurtured and what was nurturance for us and sometimes nurturance for us was our creativity and exploring our passion and things that had nothing to do with food actually Mm -hmm. so you you went into a buddhist monastery to (laughs) try to work further on this problem right what made you do that no not really uh Mm -hmm. it was sort of um I was having some struggles in the treatment field, and I had these treatment centers. It was very hard to motivate my staff and all of these kind of issues. And they had this Life of the Buddha workshop, as it was advertised, and it was going to explain how Buddha had uh, conflicts amongst his followers, and there were a lot of schisms in the eating disorder field at the time, and I was all involved in that. And how did a Buddhist handle these issues? So I said, well, let me go see if I can get some professional training in this area. I had no intention of really dealing with myself personally. (laughs) I had already lost about my first 65 to 70 pounds, Mm -hmm. and I was feeling pretty hot about myself, and I was doing well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the first... 
when I called up about it, and it's gr very funny. This book is very funny. It's a memoir about spiritual surrender. And I first called the headmaster and asked him about the place. And he kept saying, well, what's your experience in Buddhism? So I go through this whole thing of auditioning for him and showing <laughs> off how I go to Ramdas lectures and I know stuff, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he finally said they'd let me in. I really shouldn't have So thought. it wasn't easy to get in. Oh, no. Oh, that's I've, interesting. I fought my way in. And <laughs> then, of course, I found out that my wardrobe was too loud and too sexy. And huh. I had to get more subdued clothing. They had all these <laughs> rules. <laughs> and uh, I arrived there late, Miss Diva, you know. And I was all worried about my nail job and my, my jewelry. And... Uh, the first uh, time that the monk saw me, he said, uh, you know, your blouse is a bit low cut for our huh. our practice here. Hmm. And I said, oh, don't worry. That was just the plane on the way up. Uh, as soon as I get to my room, I'll change. And he said, you have no room. <laughs> <laughs> and I let that pass. And then he sent me to meditation instruction. And the monk there was a woman monk. And she said, you know, you're wearing perfume. That's against our practice here. I said, oh, don't worry. As soon as I get to my room, I'm just going to wash it off, you know. She said, you <laughs> have no room. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to let that go by. I'm really motivated to stay here. Well, by the end of the evening, we had our first meditation session where my legs gave out from under me, from sitting. You know, I wasn't used to any of this. And all of a sudden... The guy comes in and he says, okay, well, now prepare a chamber for sleeping. And all these people knew what to do, and they ran out, and they got these mattresses, and they brought them in, and they laid them on the floor of the temple. <laughs> and I realized what was going on, and I just burst out crying. And he <laughs> said, would you like to get a mattress? And I said, I don't think I could stay here. And I started this whole thing, and I called up my my lover at the time and said, get me out of here. And uh, anyway, they were so kind and gentle to meet the monks, and they mm. understood, and they said, nothing wrong with being afraid. I said, I'm not afraid. I look <laughs> afraid. <laughs> and so that was one of the first things I had to own about myself. Loss of privacy. Right. Well, I and I had all my plans. You know, I had brought my computer mm. and my headset, and I was going to listen mm. to music, and I had all these ideas. Mm. And to not be in control. Mm -hmm. And you see, mm. we love to eat because we can control that. That's a form of nurturance. We don't need anybody else. It's the most intimate experience. Mm. And here I was in a situation where other people were going to be in charge. Mm. And when I argued with the monk about it, he said, you know, we create this discipline so that you can fall apart. <laughs> and my God, that just washed over me. Mm. And I realized how much as this, the citadel that I had mm. built had to crumble. So they were giving you an opportunity, actually. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you see... Whenever I'm faced with an area of not being in control, mm -hmm. I immediately congeal around mm -hmm. fighting behavior. And, and that right? was the problem, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and overeating is a defense against allowing your own vulnerability. You know, that we're all more simply human than otherwise. And we have so much more in common with our fellows than competitive. Look at our society, how it handles weight loss. The biggest loser competition. <laughs> I will win and you will lose. And all of that stuff is helping get us fatter and fatter. So what I got to learn in this book by going to India and Burma and encountering people who come from a whole different gentility was that uh, you, you give up the minor skirmishes in order to win the greater war. And the greater war is with self. You know, all of my books have been about relationships because I am a family therapist. But the first one was about the family constellation. Then the second one was about mothers and daughters. The third one was about you and your lover, about sexuality. And then finally, this book is about me and me. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I face the things about myself that I'm a little bit embarrassed about, mm -hmm. I don't feel perfect about? What surprised you about yourself? What, what was something you had to face that Well, one key? of the biggest things was that F word, fear. Mm -hmm. I had 
fashioned a personality that anyone would have told you, she is so courageous. Look at how she makes it through life, you know? And I bought into that too. And a, a lot in this book is also about my relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother was mentally ill and a very, very fearful person. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I had the overreaction of, I'm mm -hmm. not going to be like that, and I'm not going to be fear fear we had the, We had the same mother. Ah, <laughs> we are sisters under yeah. the skin, <laughs> right. Okay, so I became courageous and never owned my fear and my, my littleness. Mm -hmm. And what I got from these monks and then the people in Asian countries was a chance to just gentle down. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, then allowed me to be with a man who was more appropriate for me. Mm -hmm. I had, in the past, always dated men who were kind of tough guys, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted them to tame me because mm -hmm. I was so wild. You yeah, know? interesting charismatic personalities, sort of, uh, yeah, a little, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, the conflict. Mm -hmm. I, I kept seeking the conflicts, mm -hmm. but... Uh, Today, my life is a lot more gentle, and actually, conflicts are kind of boring. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, when you get to that point, you know, what a concept, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to grow up a little. Yeah, 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 and it wasn't maybe the way they taught us or, or the way we responded to what was going on, because I do know what you mean about fear when you grow up in that kind of environment. Yeah. And then you go like, I don't want to be like that, so you go like, well, I'm going to be in control, right? That's right, you exactly. Know? But in being controlled, there's a cost, Right. Well, the cost in my case uh, ended up on my hips. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, for many people, that is the case. And so when they tell me, oh, I just like to eat, I say, well, let's see. And if you want to find out why you're eating, don't. You cannot figure it out while you're still eating. Mm. But the minute you curve that in, curve that in just a little bit, and it's always been about discipline, hasn't it? Mm. it what, can I accept some external discipline imposed on me, whether it's my food plan or the rules at the mm. monastery? And then eventually I will develop more personal integrity and have my own internal discipline. Mm. But when so many people talk to overeaters about getting their act together uh, they don't realize they don't have the muscles built up yeah. yet yeah yeah well you know because you said an interesting thing um that actually i've never heard before i mean it's true that you are in control we we are in control when we eat right because we're doing it we're we're eating yeah you know we but, love it but my question to you would be you know there is a uh, the body has a certain intelligence at least when i eat i've come to learn that my body, if I listen, will tell me exactly. If I take one bite too much, it will tell me, you mm -hmm. know. And so I guess in a sense, maybe I'm surrendering to my body. Um, well, is that's that probably, you've... yeah, that's probably going to be a lot of what's going to come in my next book is mm -hmm. about owning your animal. Mm -hmm. And in both sexuality and eating, our brains don't rule. Yeah. These are yeah. areas that are animal. And... Uh, you actually touched on something that's one of the key things in the new book, and that is, um, well, the story that I tell is that a, uh, a New York literati person was at one of these publishing parties in New York, and there was a monk there, a Buddhist monk, and she went up to him and said, okay, tell me, what's Buddhism? <laughs> and he said, well, do you want the short version or the long version? Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, it's a party. Give <laughs> me the short version. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, the short vers version is pay attention. Well, I need more than that. What's the long version? He said, the long version is pay attention, pay attention, <laughs> pay attention, you know? And yeah. you were just describing yourself as a person who can pay attention and notice what her body's telling her. But here's the problem. Your body, if you've been an overeater all your life as I was, your body is also working against you a little bit because yeah. you have this homeostatic set point right and your body will try to keep going back to that you know now that i've lost all this weight my fat cells are still out there waiting to be filled mm -hmm. it's a cellular thing huh? yeah and yeah. so sometimes it's not till like two or three years 
until your body stabilizes at yeah. the new weight. It took me a long time to get to that point. But I asked it the question because I, when you were talking about surrender, I was thinking, so in a way, that was, at least for me, that was a way that I learned to surrender because it's like, yeah, I'm in control when I eat. But then I began to sense there was another force there. It wasn't just me. Okay. You know, and I think in a way, you just made me think of this. Maybe I started surrendering to there was some other intelligence there. Right. You know, and but it took me a long time. Right. To well, you know, what that. we do in treatment centers and I do in seminars is I teach the divine dine and I teach people how to modulate their eating behavior and chew their food to mm -hmm. liquid and slow down. And people hate me for it. <laughs> and I recommend only doing it one meal a week. Mm -hmm. You don't have to eat this way forever. But it starts helping to retrain you for the things you're talking about. Yeah. Because we're used to guzzling. There's this automatic, you know. And then, of course, the body wants more. And we also have this taste thing. If we And a lot of studies have shown that overeaters are very much concerned about taste. And when we find something we like... One bite is too many and a thousand isn't enough. <laughs> you know, we just keep going. we got to clean the plate. So some of my recommendations to people, my quickies are one of them is leave the last string bean. Mm -hmm. You know, to learn how to just leave that last. Leave something. Yeah, leave something to the universe mm -hmm. just to keep training yourself that you don't have to clean the plate. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes people don't even like slow eaters because I'm like the slowest eater in the world. And uh, people go like, what's the matter? You know what I mean? It's like, oh it's yeah. just, you know, yeah. there's that. Well, so. it's just like, you know, in alcoholism, people don't like to go out with moderate drinkers yeah. when they're alcoholic. It's True. like, hey, you're letting that ice melt in your glass. <laughs> Drink it already. I know. People, it's, it's funny. They just want to project onto you like our other guest was saying. You know, yes. it's like very. So tell us how people can get in touch with you. My website is judyhollis.com, and my phone is 1-800-8-ENOUGH. That's 800, <laughs> That's the number 8, E-N-O-U-G-H. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you um, do you give any consultations with people? Or? I do. I do mostly phone consultations mm -hmm. now because I travel a lot, and mm -hmm. I live in paradise in Palm Springs, California. I also do uh, teleseminars on the Internet, and people can sign up for those if they like. And I do mostly phone a little bit mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, New York, and Palm Springs. I do some face-to-face uh, -face mm -hmm. when I'm in those cities with people. Very good. Well, the book is From Bagels to Buddha, uh, just out, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, join us next week. Same time, same station for the book beat. And this is the show with homework. This week, uh, find a good book. And if you can't find one, just seriously consider the idea that maybe you could write one yourself. So we'll see you next week here on the book beat. And remember, all shows are archived here at letalklive.com, where we are more than just talk. Handcrafted for your listening pleasure. You're tuned in to LA Talk Live, where we're more than just talking.